I have good dreams on it. Oh, I'm sure I have good dreams sometimes, but I don't seem to remember the good dreams. Um, the ones that I remember are the nightmares. On July 18th, 2019, the Journal of Medical Internet Research published an article, an article titled, I can't, I can't start a video like this. No, like, dude, this is about like the internet, like, I just, I think I have good dreams on it. Oh, I'm sure I have good dreams sometimes, but I don't seem to remember the good dreams. Um, the ones that I remember are the nightmares. <laughs> This is the first trailer made for Neuralink, a company that, according to their 2019 white paper, seeks to make a brain-machine interface with thousands of channels. It is spearheaded by Elon Musk, the current CEO, and was co-founded by Max Hodak, who was also president until his sudden departure in May of 2021, just a few weeks ago. So, what is Neuralink? Neuralink is a BMI or BCI company, a brain machine interface or brain computer interface. BMIs and BCIs are a class of technology that seek to connect neurological signals directly to machines or computers, and the technology has been around for a couple decades. External or non-invasive BMIs can be seen here. Those caps read electrical signals from the brain and send those signals via some wires to a computer. An invasive BMI or internal can be seen with cochlear implants, where a receiver sends electrical signals straight into the auditory nerve, which is then sent via the nervous system to the brain. Neuralink is different than other BMIs for a couple reasons. One, they have funding, and lots of it. Musk is one of the richest men in the history of the world, and he can provide a lot of capital and exposure that smaller medical companies are unable to secure, Two, they are invasive, which means the Neuralink chip is meant to be surgically implanted beneath the skull, with electrodes directly in the brain, transmitting data wirelessly to an app on your phone. And three, by making their wires nano-thin, the Neuralink device will be able to connect with individual neurons in the brain, each wire a channel, and therefore thousands of channels will mean thousands of specific data points. And then as orders of magnitude, more channels orders of magnitude more neurons that we're recording from. So Neuralink is working to make a comprehensive thousand channel surgically implanted wireless device with the full cultural weight of Elon Musk to support them. In August of 2020, Neuralink streamed their progress update on YouTube, which will be the focus of this video. A few days after that stream, the New York Times published a fantastic opinion titled, The Brain Implants That Could Change Humanity. In that article, the author goes through a lot of the semi-fantastic, semi-realistic, semi-horrific applications that this device will bring, and has some pretty incredible phrases, such as, people can already fly drones with their brain signals, or, Facebook is working on a brain-reading, helmet-like contraption that uses infrared light to peer into the brain, and concludes with, the only way out of the technology-driven hole we're in is more technology and science, he told me. That's just a cool fact of life. Yes, science! Two days after the New York Times published that opinion, the MIT Technology Review published an article titled Elon Musk's Neuralink is Neuroscience Theater. In that article, the author takes a much more critical stance towards Musk's grand claims and is skeptical about what Neuralink will actually accomplish. The author highlights the tendency for Musk to overpromise, emphasizing moments where his rhetoric just outpaces science. 
and so it didn't really have as many great quotes as the New York Times piece, but it did have a great name for the next world-famous electronic noise artist, Pigs in the Matrix. <laughs> When reacting to companies connected to Elon Musk, many will find themselves, like these two articles, along the entire spectrum of dystopian daydreaming and pragmatically dismissing. The reaction to Neuralink is no different, except here the stakes do seem higher, the daydream more alluring and the dystopia more foreboding, because unlike a self-driving car, a super-fast tunnel, or even Martian indentured servitude, Neuralink is a technology that strikes at the very core of our human experience, and it's almost marketed as being a device that will change one's sense of self. At the end of the aforementioned 2020 Progress Update livestream, the host Siobhan asked the panelists of scientists and entrepreneur this final question. What is the number one thing on your wish list that you're really hoping that the Neuralink device will do over time that you're working towards? By focusing on the individual replies to that question, I hope to paint a pretty comprehensive portrait of Neuralink's ideology regarding the human experience. These responses, which are both realistic yet highly speculative, show that BMI technology is an incredibly powerful yet awkwardly metaphysical technology, one that will doubtlessly have a massive impact on the future of humanity. In the 1630s, René Descartes wrote his famous Treatise on Man. He writes clearly, I make the supposition that the body is nothing else but a statue or earthen machine. He goes on to describe how the motions of the body are like the inner workings of fountains and mechanical processes, how our bones and muscles and limbs are tools that our soul uses to engage with the world. Since before and after Descartes, there have been many who offered radically different conceptions of the human being. Yet, the Neuralink team's implicit description of human consciousness and experience is extremely similar to what Descartes described in 1633. By isolating human consciousness entirely within the skull, human beings become skin suits, animated by that spark of electric consciousness. In that isolation, there is a lot of humanity that necessarily must be neglected, a lot of temporal, abstract, or philosophical problems that arise. And as these panelists outline their hopes for the future that they're working towards, I will do my best to simultaneously outline further what such a future could truly look like. Uh, so my, my background is in visual neuroscience, and uh, one of the things I think has great potential for the Neuralink is to provide a visual prosthesis for people who have retinal injury or blindness through eye injury. You can essentially uh, plug a camera directly into the visual cortex and stimulate with an enormous array of thousands or maybe tens of thousands of electrodes to recreate a, a visual image. And in time, perhaps, you can use that same technology in people who haven't lost vision to produce some kind of heads-up display, um, something like uh, Terminator or something like that. <laughs> Wonderful. In, in fact, it's worth saying that like, over time, we could actually give somebody supervision uh, like you could have like uh, ultraviolet or infrared uh, or <laughs> see in radar, like basically name your frequency um, and, you, and you can just dynamically adjust the sensor or have se sensors that feed into the visual cortex across a wide range of, of frequencies and, ac and actually have uh, superhuman vision. The first thing I would like to point out is the utter lack of irony that these men felt when referencing Terminator as a metaphor, as if Terminator isn't literally a film about the dystopian future of losing control of humanity due to technological progress. The film Terminator did not show us a cool product demo, it showed how a lifeless and soulless computer sees the world. Anyway, to be fair to Dan, he isn't talking out of his ass. And as I go through the responses in the panel, I will try to follow the same process for each panelist. First, I will highlight any science or studies that support what they're saying. And then I will try to do some legwork in the philosophical areas that they clearly neglected. So, vision. In 2005, Nature reported on a study that showed a specific neuron was associated with Jennifer Aniston's face. While the authors note the study did not demonstrate the idea of a grandmother neuron, where the brain contains a single neuron for every object in the world, 
aka one neuron per gramma, the study nonetheless demonstrated that, for the subject, there is a single neuron associated with Jennifer Aniston's face, scientifically indicating a connection between neurons and images. In a 2019 article published in Nature, scientists were actually able to cause hallucinations in mice. Christoph Koch, president of the Allen Institute for Brain Science, said, quote, It's playing the piano of the mind. This study is pretty insane. Scientists genetically altered mice neurons to fire when stimulated with light. They showed mice horizontal bars and vertical bars, and trained the mice to drink from a tube when they saw the vertical bars. After determining which neurons were associated with seeing the vertical bars, scientists triggered those neurons via light stimulation, and the mice drank. Clearly, some visual information was successfully analyzed and manipulated for these mice. An LA company called Second Sight is developing a device dubbed Argus, named after the Greek giant with a hundred eyes, and it seeks to restore functional artificial vision in a manner very similar to how cochlear implants restore functional artificial hearing. The science behind restoring vision, then, is therefore in the very early stages of development. If only you could see what I've seen with your eyes. So that 2019 nature study and Argus device show that visual information to some degree is able to be read or interpreted by electrical devices in the brain. Scientifically, it stands to reason that one could plug a camera directly into the visual cortex. But what does it mean to see? Did those mice see visual bars blotting out their normal vision? Did they see the bars as if daydreaming in some mixed reality? Did they even see anything at all? Many people would acknowledge the difference between looking and seeing, that a digital photograph is not a copy of reality, and that sight carries with it a tinge of our consciousness, a coloration of our imagination. If I actually just plug a camera directly into my visual cortex, is that all that seeing is? If there was one camera streaming to everyone's mind, would they all suddenly see things exactly the same? If everyone has a Neuralink, will everything look exactly the same? Now, I don't have an answer here, but that's exactly the point. These panelists act as if they have a complete map of the human experience, as if seeing is nothing more than the apprehension of the electromagnetic spectrum, which it is, but it is so much more than that. The experience of sight is more rich and complicated than photography. Surely, life cannot be seen through the robotic eyes of Terminator and still be described as beautiful. Yeah, so for me, uh, telepathy. So I, I think it's an um, incredible amount of effort to put your thoughts into a set of words, and you know, it comes out completely compressed. So being able to do that seamlessly without being able to compress it with all of the mechanisms it would be great. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like just a, I'm sorry, to add further to that. Um, um, in fact, when I did the Wait But Why article, um, I, um, I think Tim thought I said consensual telepathy, um, but I said conceptual telepathy. <laughs> I, I would presume it would be consensual. Um, <laughs> Uh, because you definitely don't want just p people, you know, s sending stuff into your brain without your consent. But um, <laughs> a, a lot of our uh, brain uh, thought capacity is go goes into uh, compressing our thoughts into words. Um, and then you think of like the, the, the data rate of words. Words are a very slow, very low data rate. And and we're putting a tremendous amount of mental energy into compressing the concepts and thoughts in our head into words, and then slowly talking. Speech is so very, very slow. And uh, we could actually send um, the, the true thoughts. That we can basically have far better communication because we can convey the actual concepts, the actual thoughts, uncompressed to somebody else. So non-linguistic, consensual, and conceptual <laughs> yes, telepathy. Exactly. Okay. Non-linguistic, non, non <laughs> consensual, 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 consensual,
Similar to how scientists have decoded hearing and vision to restore lost senses by analyzing brain patterns with advanced algorithms and associating those patterns with desired or expected speech outcomes, scientists can map speech to neural information. This doesn't touch upon telepathy per se, but more so indicates that neural patterns apparent during speech are starting to be understood by computers, enabling a future where you can think of what to say and a neural decoder will say it for you. Kind of like how your smartphone can take your audio and convert it to words. You would like me to call you. <laughs> this is very new science, yet the Neuralink team doesn't stop at just transmitting text or speech through electric signals. They go so much further and discuss transmitting true thoughts, actual thoughts, and uncompressed thoughts. There are a lot of assumptions rolled in here. One, there is the assumption that thoughts precede language, which they might, but maybe what we think of when we think of thoughts are the results of language. And two, there is the assumption that language is a slow form of communication which should be optimized, with no benefit to slow communication. So on the first assumption that thoughts precede language, maybe. There are arguments to be had about the ability for animals and children to communicate effectively without the apparent use of what we call language. However, we've never discussed metaphysics without language, so how do we know that we can? Actually, we've never discussed anything without language. All of our conceptions about understanding, communication, discussion, dialogue, dialectic, questioning, wondering, all of it is tied into our conceptions of language. Even Wittgenstein, who famously and controversially stated, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent, would likely balk at the notion that, given the correct tech, language should simply be seen as an inefficiency of the past. When you want to know the meaning of a word, don't look inside yourself. Look at the uses of the word in our way of life. Zen masters would use koans, these seemingly meaningless riddles to show the limits of language, such as, what is the Buddha? Answer, a dried shit stick. One thing that strikes me about these koans is that there are certain questions, certain fundamentals or understandings that do deserve silence. Some truths are perhaps best expressed non-vocally and therefore some thoughts are perhaps best expressed non-linguistically. But to simply assume that language is nothing more than the compression of preformed thoughts is to deny any utility to language at all as if we would all be better off cutting out that middleman of language and just pinging our distilled intentions to each other's iPhones. Which brings me to assumption two. Language is slow, and that's bad. We want faster thoughts. Gotta go fast. Must go faster. And as I questioned earlier, slower compared to what? Maybe Elon here is talking about how the perfect cocktail of psilocybin, dream pop, and Monet provides a much faster means to communicate melancholic beauty than a poem. But I doubt it. He is comparing the speed of language to the speed of computers. Hard disk read-write speeds. I can copy the entire Tractus Philosophicus by Wittgenstein to my hard drive in under a minute but I find it very difficult to believe that I could transmit the entire essence of that work to another human being just as fast, if only pesky words weren't getting in the way. The communication between humans and between computers are vastly different, and comparing their speeds seems strange. In poetry class, students are often told to pare down their writing, take their 10-page epic ode to bath time gurgles, and make it a sonnet. There is a benefit to that compression. There is something powerfully important in the process of squeezing our thoughts into words. Narrative is often how our experience can enter reality, and oftentimes in trauma therapy or psychology therapies, there will be a push to talk things out or write things out. Take those raw, unrefined impulses and shape them into something that you can actually understand. Now, that isn't to say that all experiences must be talked about, that in order to understand the world, we have to first discuss it. Socrates would probably be on board for that, but Wittgenstein or a Zen master sure wouldn't be, and either way, that's not the point. 
The point is that language is clearly vitally important to how we approach and understand the world, and to simply dismiss it as the compressed outcomes of thoughts better expressed in binary feels as equally preposterous as it does pompous. Would I really feel that I can understand myself and my identity if I didn't have that wonderful tool of a name? Say my name. As you may now be thinking, well, language is just one form of communication and expression. I mean, surely the Neuralink team doesn't think that all expression is useless, right? The process of creating art is still important. Not all expression is useless, right? I'm going to skip over Ian real quick and get to Paul, because he and DJ said some similar things, but I promise I will return to you, Ian. So to, to sort of follow up on Elon's thoughts, um, you know, I feel, and I imagine a lot of other people feel the same way, that there's a lot of um, sort of trapped creativity in your mind, you know, you can, for example, you know, close your eyes and conjure up like an incredible, like Dali-esque scene. But you know, if I wanted to actually show someone that, it would, yeah, it would take years of, cra you know, honing a craft to be able to paint that. And so, you know, potentially with enough electrodes in the right places, you could begin to sort of tap into those raw concepts or thought vectors and be able to um, decode that and, and show people. It could be for, you know art, you imagine music, or even for like engineering, like a three-dimensional model. And, like, so mental it. artistry is a new field. <laughs> <laughs> like Elon and his idea of actual thoughts pre-linguistic, Paul here thinks the same. Paul actually explicitly calls attention to the time needed for art, describing the years necessary to hone a craft, but then concludes hoping that with Neuralink, all those years can be reduced to an instant, with enough electrodes in the right places. What these men are describing is a fundamental disregard for the experience of human beings as we move through space and time. Not only will many artists tell you that they have no idea as to what Paul is talking about, insofar as there being some clear idea in their head of their art before they begin, many artists would actually say the opposite. Merleau Ponty, in his work The Phenomenology of Perception, quotes the great painter Cezanne. In a forest, I have felt many times over that it was not I who looked at the forest. Some days I felt that the trees were looking at me were speaking to me. This idea and art of a muse or external force guiding the artist in their artistic creation is one that extends across all forms of expression. It is an intentional fallacy to think that all art begins and ends in one's mind, and the creation of art is merely putting those thoughts onto a page. Jackson Pollock would describe his trance-like state while making his art, where he had no preformed plans for where the paint would fall, Akira Yoshizawa, the famous origami master, once said, Geometry alone is not enough to portray human desires, expressions, aspirations, joys. We need something more. That something more can come from the process. That spark of the artistic can come from the tangible interaction with material, from the years spent focusing upon expression as much as it can come from within. The creation of art is not solipsistic, but at its best dissolves our conceptions of isolated minds and makes us realize that there indeed is the necessity for something more. actually been excited from the beginning sort of about the like side benefit of these devices. I sort of see them as uh, essentially like an oscilloscope to a, a printed circuit board is our device to the brain, where just by virtue of having this in there and uh, being able to see what's actually going on, you'll end up learning a ton about how the brain works. Um, and so sort of augmenting people, but also just using that to learn a lot more about like neurological diseases is really exciting to me. Ian is excited about seeing what's actually going on, augmenting people, 
and learning more about neurological diseases. Okay. Okay. I, I like to think about uh, ways to interface devices with biology better. And, and so one of the things I'm looking forward to is getting this thing to be less, um, look like, less like technology and, and more like biology and so, so that it really is, uh, you know, uh, seamlessly interfaced with the brain, stable for a very long time. And then uh, similar to that, having stimulation be much more precise and multidimensional uh, such that eventually the brain sort of doesn't really know if it's being stimulated from outside or inside and uh, you end up just sort of completely merging. Wow. 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 I feel that I am technology, so uh, I am psychologically united to cybernetics and also biologically united to cybernetics, so I identify as a cybernetic organism. So this concept of merging, where one won't be able to tell if they're being stimulated from the inside with a Neuralink or from the outside with their environment, can be seen in a 2006 study that wrote of, quote, making the prosthetic feel like the subject's own limb using microstimulation of cortical sensory areas. That study gave the clinical example of the monkey moving its own limb and a prosthetic limb simultaneously with a BMI. Eventually, the monkey no longer used its own limb at all and operated the prosthetic limb with just its brain. Fifteen years later, on April 8, 2021, Neuralink posted this video. To control his paddle on the right side of the screen, Pager simply thinks about moving his hand up or down. We've removed the joystick altogether. Now that he's up to speed, let's increase the difficulty and see how well Pager can play with the Neuralink. there was ever a time to show this clip of Keanu Reeves emerging from his BMI cocoon, it would be after watching a monkey play Pong with its thoughts. Yeah, you know, following up on stimulation, you know, one of the things our device can do is simultaneously read and write on every channel, stimulate and record. And that's, uh, you know, both a more challenging problem than it may seem like at first, but also, you know, incredibly uh, exciting, uh, the sort of the vistas that it opens up. I mean, it's really kind of the whole game in terms of interfacing with the nervous system, and I'm, I'm very excited to, to use that. What Joey is saying here underpins everything that has been said so far by Alan. With thousands of channels, each one able to detect and decode electrical signal, as well as stimulate and provide electrical signal, read and write, the coverage is comprehensive. Like Earth with its ring of satellites, soon the brain could become completely threaded. After all, Elon Musk did refer to his device as a sewing machine. With a brain so interlaced, it is easy to logically arrive at Alan's conclusion of total immersion, unable to determine the source of stimuli. And as seen in the 2006 study and MindPong video, we're getting close if not there already. But do we need to actually wait for a Neuralink to feel like we are merged? In March of 2014, the study Experimental Evidence of Massive Scale Emotional Contagion Through Social Networks was published in the Journal of Psychological and Cognitive Sciences. That journal now begins with an editorial note regarding informed consent as an issue in regard to the efficacy of Facebook's user policy. If you agree to the terms without actually knowing the terms, is that still consent? According to Facebook, and the numerous studies published using Facebook's massive amounts of data collection, the criteria is technically met. Due to the controversy following this particular study, however, an editorial note was still added. The study shows, via a massive N equals 689,003 experiment on Facebook, that emotional states can be transferred to others via emotional contagion, leading people to experience the same emotions without their awareness. The study provides experimental evidence that the emotional contagion occurs without direct interaction between people and in the complete absence of nonverbal cues. There are too many notifications, updates, and overall things to see on one's Facebook to see them all. Far too many. As in, literally not enough hours in a day too many. As a result, 
Facebook curates what is shown. They select from the mass of notifications those which are the most likely to keep you engaged. In this study, people's feeds were curated such that the extent to which people were exposed to emotional expressions in their news feed was manipulated. By reducing the amount of positive content in one control or reducing the amount of negative content in the other, the results show emotional contagion. When people's negative posts were reduced in their feeds, they in turn posted more positively, which demonstrates the spread of emotional impulses across a social network. I now wonder if over half a million people would have described themselves as merged with Facebook. Are they able to determine the source of their emotional stimuli? Yeah, I'm excited just because of the scalability of the device. We're doing everything in-house and all of it can scale to more channels, more brain regions. Um, I think, yeah, I'm really interested about solving things related to anxiety or depression or even like removing fear. Um, like I'm an athlete and to like rock climb without fear would be pretty... Maybe need a little bit of fear. Yeah. <laughs> so it'd be great if we could make the pigs fly, but... I... <laughs> I think we have an incredible opportunity to limit human suffering to a tiny fraction of what it is today uh, in all kinds of different avenues. Pain uh, being the essence of suffering, we might be able to control that finally. Uh, and so many other diseases, so much other um, suffering in the world, I think the Neuralink device could help a lot with. While Robin and Matthew said different things, I'll discuss them in tandem since they both seem to be blithely regarding human despair as something that can be fixed with very accurate electroshock therapy. So in terms of science that supports the idea of Neuralink being able to minimize anxiety, pain, depression, or suffering, in 2019, a study was published in Nature titled Brain Machine Interfaces from Motor to Mood. The study highlights how, instead of decoding movement, mood BMIs would decode a mood state and control it toward a desired therapeutic target within the abstract, multidimensional space of mood. The study concludes with the authors noting that they have laid out a path toward extending BMIs to the new frontier of neuropsychiatric disorders. Like many studies, if one is able to monitor the brain close enough and associate neural images and external observations with advanced algorithm, it stands to reason that mood would be able, to some degree, to be affected and shifted with a BMI. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Now, the authors of this study acknowledge the very gray area of ethics they are operating within and briefly point to a piece published in 2017 titled Four Ethical Priorities for Neurotechnologies and AI as a means of showing their awareness of the ethical dilemmas here. That 2017 study describes how, quote, technological developments mean that we are on a path to a world in which it will be possible to decode people's mental processes and directly manipulate the brain mechanisms underlying their intentions, emotions, and decisions. It continues to describe how this technology could, quote, profoundly alter some core human characteristics, private mental life, individual agency, and an understanding of individuals as entities bound by their bodies. I said... I'm not comfortable with my body, so I want to get rid of it. This thing, all the arms and legs and every single bit of it, I don't want to be flesh. I'm really sorry, but I'm going to escape this thing and become digital. Clearly, when discussing being able to remove fear and suffering from the human experience, one starts to encroach upon transhumanistic science, where the chains of our unregulated moods and bodies seem soon to being broken. Yet, it is a serious question as to whether these chains of suffering, depression, and anxiety can actually be broken without also breaking apart our humanity. Being extremely charitable, I can say that Matthew and Robin only want to use Neuralink as a tool amongst many to tackle these enduring human conundrums. But they claim that Neuralink will provide the solution to anxiety, depression, and suffering. Robin says she wants to live without fear. Matthew, that he wants to control pain. 
To describe these things as controllable and solvable is to describe them as somehow singular. Depression is just one thing, anxiety just one thing, just one handful of misplaced neurons. And with the right electrical stimulation, those feelings would be solved. This conceptualization of anxiety and suffering as singular things feels absurd. Those feelings are incredibly complex and woven into our entire conscious experience of the world. Warning, metaphysics ahead. For some philosophers, it's actually nonsensical to claim that one can solve these things since the solution to those feelings would be an annihilation of our consciousness. For example, Jean-Paul Sartre was an existentialist philosopher in the 20th century who wrote extensively about anxiety and what that feeling means. Anxiety is what you feel when you no longer take these structures of the world for granted, when you realize your own radical freedom, when you confront the nothingness at the center of being. This anxiety results in a feeling of nausea, the title of Sartre's most famous novel. And for example, in that novel, a scene has a man looking at the gnarled root of a tree. As he stares, he understands less and less, like a word repeated over and over. He does not take the root for granted as a root, but seems to be confronted by an utterly alien and foreign thing. He starts to see snakes and ropes and faces and shapes, but he cannot understand the root as itself. He realizes it is his own imagination projecting onto the root, as equally as he senses his own inability to ever grasp the root beyond those imaginative projections. He is radically free to create his own imaginative projections, but condemned to never see beyond that. And as he feels confronted by the root as something that exists outside anything he can define it as, that freedom leads to anxiety, which results in nausea in the face of our absurd existence. This is deeply similar to what Soren Kierkegaard wrote of in the late 19th century in his works The Sickness Unto Death and The Concept of Anxiety. Kierkegaard writes of a man perched on a cliff, as he fears both the chaotic waves below him and also the undeniable freedom he has to toss himself into them. He calls this the dizziness of freedom, a power that extends back to when Adam first realizes that he has the ability to disobey God and eat from the tree. Adam, in that moment, was anxious in the face of his own freedom. Kierkegaard also describes how despair arises from one's free will. Even though he was a devout Christian, God did not solve that despair. And for instance, you can despair over wanting to be someone else, wishing to be able to change yourself, like a man who didn't receive the promotion he wanted and wishes he was different. Yet you can also despair over wanting to be yourself, wishing to be entirely self-created, like a man who discovers his new promotion was merely luck, or even worse, simply due to his father's connections and not his own ability. This lack of freedom and the inescapability of freedom gives us feelings of anxiety. So it is no wonder that Kierkegaard describes despair as the sickness we carry until our death. Sartre and Kierkegaard are just a sample of the existentialist philosophers. For thousands of years, humanity has grappled with anguish, suffering, anxiety, depression, apathy, hopelessness, and despair. Christianity as a religion is founded upon this idea that suffering is an inescapable part of the human experience. Jesus, the Son of God, still had to suffer to be human. He still had to experience pain, even anguish, crying out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Even if one is devoutly religious, like Kierkegaard, or an atheist, like Sartre, one still recognizes that these problems of humanity, these pains and anxieties and torments, cannot be solved with an electrode. For these problems are deeply connected to our humanity, to our freedom, to our will and our metaphysics. If one truly believes that these can be solved with an electrical impulse, then what picture does that paint for humanity? If I have a Neuralink, biologically embedded into my synapses, and my brain is wired to be biologically incapable of suffering, what would it mean for me to then be benevolent? Could I conceive of empathy? I might still be a human, but would I be humane? Um, I, I think all these things are, are great uh, functions for a neural, neural link. Um, 
I think on, on, a, on a species level basis, I think it's going to be important for us to figure out um, how we uh, coexist with advanced artificial intelligence. And, um, you know, I think having, achieving some kind of AI symbiosis uh, where you have an AI extension of yourself, uh, like a tertiary layer above the limbic system and cortex, um, and, uh, and having, that, having that symbiosis be good such that the future of the world is controlled by the a combined will of the people of, of Earth. I think that that's obviously going to be the future that we want, presumably, is if it's the sum of our collective will. And, um, and so I think it's, it's going to be important from, a, from an existential threat standpoint to achieve um, a, a good AI symbiosis. And that's uh, what I think is, m m might be the, the most important thing that a device like this achieves. <laughs>
concerns about autonomy are echoed in the inescapability of YouTube rabbit holes or TikTok screen time. Concerns about privacy should reflect on Edward Snowden's revelations and the amount of data that these AI have to work with. Note the quaint line Musk has about the combined will of all people on Earth. Gee, does that sound swell. No, no one could possibly object to that, right? Yet, as I just said, AI is already here, integrated, merging. What does the combined will of the people of Earth look like now? Amazon's recommendation algorithms are based off the buying habits of their customers. But is it really in our combined will to always buy more things? TikTok's For You page is based off the combined interactions of all their users. Is it really the combined will of people to spend hours upon hours upon hours swiping through memes? The combined will of the people is a cute way of describing what AI literally is already, the algorithmic expression of innumerous human interactions with technology. As we have already seen, the combined will of the people can be manipulated. Our attentions can be directed and shaped in ways we struggle to be aware of. Predilections for violence can be exponentiated. Fears and passions can be inflamed through constant reinforcement. This talk of combined will sounds great, but Musk isn't referring to some Kantian categorical imperative we can all agree on with logic and reason. He is not using Confucian societal ontologies to describe how society shapes our identity and how the combined culture of our upbringing manifests in our will. He is narrating a fantasy over the face of our currently entangled and mangled reality. The internet is great, but it is undeniable that it is really fucking with my brain. You will die! What the fuck? Yeah. Why is this hell? Ah. Is removing any separation and implanting the internet and AI straight into my gray matter actually a good idea? If Musk seriously thinks that this is the best way to preserve our species, how does he currently view our consciousness? I have, in many ways, a very basic science interest, which is I'm really interested in, in the nature of consciousness. And that's, there's a lot of very silly philosophy that's been written about it over the last thousand years. I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you, I make you laugh, I'm here to fucking amuse you. What do you mean funny? Funny how? How am I funny? Um, but I think that it's really, we've been very limited by the tools and our ability to uh, interrogate and, and measure the brain. And as these tools get better, um, it will pull it into the realm of physics. And it's really one of the last big, great mysteries in, in science. So here we are, the peak of Neuralink. CEO Elon Musk talking about AI symbiosis, current president Max Hodak claiming to use science to solve the hard problem of consciousness. It is genuinely a little difficult for me to respond civilly to Max because he, in all seriousness, actually dismisses all philosophy from the past thousand years as silly, literal millennia of philosophy regarding mental states, the self, imagination, metaphysics, and consciousness is useless because we didn't have a good enough microscope. It's absolutely mind-boggling arrogance with an astonishing amount of ignorance. Max is claiming that consciousness is a mystery of science, to be solved with physics at some point, and as such, there really aren't many scientific studies that outline the nature of consciousness for me to point to. On the other hand, the history of the philosophy of consciousness is so wide and rich that I could not possibly touch upon it all. And instead, I will focus upon a singular text, Husserl's Cartesian Meditations. Edmund Husserl, a silly philosopher from Germany in the 19th century, wrote a response to Descartes' meditations. In that work, Descartes famously stated, Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. In doing so, he created what continental philosophers would later refer to as the mind-body problem. If you think and then exist, your thoughts or essence precede your existence. Your body is detached from your mind. You become a skin suit with blood pumps animating your rational thinking soul. And this is the same idea that Descartes expands on in his essay on man, which I referenced at the start of this video. It is the idea that you who you are, with a capital Y, is a nebulous thinking thing. Your body is merely the attachments to it, the tool you use to engage with the world. I am not my arm, I have an arm, because who I am is something other than this body I have. 
And here we can already see that despite claiming philosophy is useless, Max is actually just agreeing with Descartes and is himself making a metaphysical claim nonetheless. With logic, with reasoning and science, and tools of the mind alone, one can understand consciousness. I am not a scholar of Husserl, so expect only a basic description here. Husserl wrote his Cartesian Meditations in an effort to explain phenomenology. Phenomenology is the study of structures of consciousness as experienced from the first-person point of view. The central structure of an experience is its intentionality, its being directed towards something. Phenomenology seeks to dive into the things themselves. It strives to create a foundation for existence that does not stem from logical conclusions, but rather from experience. Husserl writes that it is by no means accepted as a matter of course that with our self-evident pure ego that now the problem is to infer the rest of the world by rightly conducted arguments. When Descartes said, I think therefore I am, he kind of trapped himself within his mind. If cognitive awareness of an ego or of a self is what allows one to know one exists, then how do I know the world exists? How do I know I am not a brain in a vat? How do I know I'm not in the matrix? Descartes attempts to solve that problem with a series of logical statements and conclusions, which Husserl kind of ridicules here. Cogito, I think, or I am conscious, is not enough for Husserl, because consciousness is consciousness of something. It is that intentional of, that opening of the world of experience that pushes Husserl deeper than Descartes in his quest for a foundation for philosophy. Rather than searching the ego or conducting logical arguments from the ego, Husserl instead wished to dive into experience, into the things themselves. Consciousness is intentional, directed, and relational. Husserl writes how consciousness is a describable structure of multiplicities, one where unity is a unity of synthesis, not merely a continuous connectedness of cognitions, but a connectedness that makes the unity of one consciousness. What? As you can see, Husserl can be kind of tough to chew on, but it seems that Husserl is describing consciousness as a non-singular unity. You cannot logically conclude the world from your thoughts because your thoughts are intertwined with the world itself. The multiplicity of the world becomes unified in your consciousness, but your ego, yourself, is not some isolated thing, but a synthesis of everything. Even though Husserl wrote this in the 19th century in Germany, that conception of consciousness shares similarities with many other philosophies over time. Philip J. Ivanhoe explained the oneness hypothesis, a hypothesis derived from the thousands of years of East Asian metaphysics, and describes how human beings are intimately and inextricably intertwined and share a common destiny with the other people, creatures, and things of the world. In this hypothesis, an isolated consciousness becomes impossible to reconcile with the multiplicitous and intertwined nature of the self. From this philosophical position, one sees that it becomes strange to assume that consciousness is a problem that can be solved once the human brain is better mapped. For many philosophers and thinkers, consciousness can only be understood when one also understands the relation between oneself and the world. Knowing neural pathways will help me understand consciousness, but so will knowing art, knowing human relationships, knowing politeness. Imagine a man who looks out and sees land no one has ever seen before, and so he makes the first map. His sketches are rough, filled with inaccuracies and idiosyncrasies, but it's a map nonetheless. Over time, his map gets better. He adds elevation markers and contour lines. He creates GPS, radio signals. He begins to catalog every grain of sand using an electron tunneling microscope. Eventually, he has the geography compiled flawlessly. He has every single geographical molecule mapped successfully. But as he stares at the map, he realizes it does not tell him in which river he will catch the tastiest fish, nor under which tree he will have the most restful sleep. He realizes that there are parts to his environment and to himself that cannot be mapped, cannot be logically analyzed, but instead must be experienced. <laughs> This, to me, is what Husserl means when he calls to return to the things themselves, to realize that your environment must be experienced to understand your consciousness. 
That's not to say that Husserl solved consciousness, or really even came close. Decades of philosophers have criticized, praised, or outright contradicted what Husserl wrote. I could have chosen Confucius, or Heidegger, or Aristotle, and there would always be those who agreed and disagreed and everything in between. The reason I outlined Husserl's philosophy is to show that the attitudes of these panelists, though uniform, are not demonstrably true. They are all outlining what seems to be a very similar view of consciousness, and they all seem to have arrived at similar conclusions for the way the human experience is structured, but that's not because they're right. I'm not saying they're wrong, but they are definitely missing a lot. And when watching this presentation, one does not get the sense that the panelists are aware of the philosophical ramifications of what they are proposing. On the contrary, one gets the sense that they would regard those ramifications as silly. So for me, can you imagine a disease-free future? Um, a future where you know you know what's going to happen to you before it happens, so you can prevent it. Uh, with these devices, we'll be able to not just pick up electrical signals, but we can also pick up chemical clues uh, in the brain. And if if you're successful, which I know we are, um, we'll be able to uh, kind of prevent ahead of time, you know. Uh, um, diseases uh, and really the functionality of these devices is widespread. Um, um, so I'm looking forward to the future. Felix seems to be on the same wavelength as Robin and Matthew insofar as he views this device as being the solution to human disease and pestilence. Bring out <laughs> What's interesting about Felix is that he seems to imply being able to see the future and stop diseases before you get them. By hinting at chemical clues, Felix is noting that in having electrodes so close to the brain, any changes could be immediately found and potentially nullified. By getting closer to the brain, medical predictions or telltale signs could reach farther and farther back in time, where perhaps the brains of people who develop Alzheimer's as octogenarians exhibit a specific firing pattern in their early teens. Now, it's tough to say where this will end since we are now in the realm of divination. Will the Neuralink device help detect disease five years down the line? Ten? A hundred? Will I be able to know the most likely scenario for my biological death? The only thing that's really more dangerous than knowing the future for certain is knowing the future with a false certainty. And I actually won't even bother now going through all the negative potentialities that come from presuming to know what will happen to you before it happens. There are a lot of stories, books, and film that highlight the danger when humans assume the hubris of foresight. I'm full of scorpions is my mind. I'm really excited about uh, the opportunity to help people overcome uh, challenges that they face through life circumstances, bad luck, through no fault of their own, spinal cord injury, brain disease, some devastating things that completely change your life. Hopefully we can uh, help them get some function back. These smart arms are controlled by my brain through a neural link. Thanks, Zach. It does seem that restoring motor function, perhaps after a spinal cord injury, is something that a Neuralink device will certainly be used for in the near future. Numerous studies have demonstrated the ongoing progress of using BCIs to restore mobility, from this 2013 article, this 2016 study, and this 2020 article. The 2020 article is actually an interview with Professor Ben He, the department head of biomedical engineering at Carnegie Mellon University and a leading scientist in the non-invasive BCI field. His team developed new methods for non-invasive BCIs to control drones by thoughts. In 2019, his team demonstrated the control of a robotic arm to follow a continuously randomly moving target on the screen. Ben notes that while the invasive procedures are indubitably better indubitably. at recording single neuron activity, the broad regional recordings of the EEG may offer their own functional meaning. Ben also has this quote, which just unsettles me for some reason, perhaps because I'd recently read a 2016 article published in the Journal of Brain Computer Interfaces titled, are BMI prosthetics uncontrollable Frankensteinian monsters? The article goes through some of the potential legal implications of having an AI algorithm prosthetic, writing that this device could confound issues of cause and effect for ascertaining and assigning criminal guilt, since the prosthetic may move as a result of preconscious rather than conscious thought. 
noting that command and control of these devices are relevant for our colloquial conceptions of free will. While the article argues that these devices will not be Frankensteinian, but rather will have to fight the legal and public conception that they are, the article nevertheless ends on a rather lukewarm consideration that humans will likely always retain some control. In terms of all the panelists so far, having an exoskeleton or assisted prosthetic is likely going to be one of Neuralink's first real advances, since the field of non-invasive BMIs have already done so much legwork in this area. One thing I wish that Zach had implied, mentioned, or in some way indicated was that the people whose circumstances are being overcome wanted help. You won't be able to reverse time. Those people will be changed due to their circumstances, and I feel uncomfortable just assuming that every person would simply choose to fix what happened. Perhaps their experience is itself a worthwhile and important aspect of their existence, and you shouldn't assume that they hate their circumstances in life. I know and love many humans with uh, autism spectrum disorder, so I'm really interested to see how the Neuralink might be able to support them if they chose to do that. This is the best response by far. She chooses her words carefully. The device could support them if they choose to do that. Great. It is, however, disheartening that she is the only panelist that mentions people having a choice. Yeah, so I mean, everyone else along the line has had uh, you know, amazing ideas and suggestions, and yeah, for me, it's it's about you know memories, and everyone loses those memories over time. You know, I, I already can't remember what happened to me when I was younger, and you know, I will, it'll only get worse. And so, having a repository of memories that you can access whenever you want, if you're feeling down, you can go access some good memories. You know, if you you miss something or you miss somebody, you can go and access those memories, and I I think that would just be such a life changing experience to be able to just tap into that. And to round it off, we have Sam, who upon watching this Black Mirror episode, thought to himself, I want to be the guy who invents that. And honestly, he might be. Who, who am I? In 2019, a study was published in the Journal of Current Biology, titled Artificially Enhancing and Suppressing Hippocampus Mediated Memories. This study showed how Acute reactivation of both dorsal and ventral hippocampus cells that were previously active during memory formation drove freezing behavior, place avoidance, and place preference. Moreover, chronic stimulation of dorsal or ventral hippocampal fear memories produced a context-specific reduction or enhancement of fear responses respectively, thus demonstrating bidirectional and context-specific modulation of memories along the logical axis of the hippocampus. In other words, the study showed that scientists could enhance or reduce the volume or intensity of memories, and concludes noting how the research could treat stress-related neuropsychiatric disorders. Sam doesn't even talk about neuropsychiatric disorders, he really just wants to straight up replay memories. Thankfully, Black Mirror already demonstrated cinematically why this could easily destroy your life. Memories are an incredibly complicated and nuanced part of human consciousness, and are as intertwined with our environment and consciousness as anything mentioned thus far. The idea of being able to loop the best moments of my life endlessly, or lobotomize years of my life that are cringe, is a deeply disturbing idea. Memories are powerful, yet as the 2019 study showed, we are on our way to attempt to harness that power. We went on quite a journey, from discussing Terminator vision to telepathy, removing fear and suffering, merging with AI, solving consciousness, having robot arms, and living in memory. As I said in the beginning, I tried to do some legwork in ethical and philosophical areas that these panelists missed, but I am not the only one doing this work. A 2019 article published in a journal of virtual economics does a pretty horrific job of trying to point out ethical issues regarding Neuralink. That article concludes saying that, quote, The idea of implanting a chip into people's brains sounds terrifying, perhaps simply because it is new, but ethics keep changing with human progress. In the past, slavery was acceptable, whereas it is now strongly prohibited by law. We should have slaves. So, I'm, I'm sure the people who were just being enslaved did not think to themselves, this is ethically okay. And I honestly won't even try touching that ethical and moral garbage fire. 
what this author is pointing out is a common fallacy regarding technology's progress, that early tech is only seen as immoral because it is early, that human ethics will adapt, that progress must be continued for progress sake, even at the expense of slaves, human suffering, and morality. Not a scientist would not be bound by petty morality. More often than not, that line of thinking leads directly into transhumanism, where humans may now suffer immeasurably as their gray matter is directly manipulated, but it will all be worth it when we become gods. A much better ethical analysis can be found in this 2019 article and this 2018 article. In the 2018 article, the author describes how Unlike technologies of the past, a BCI is an entirely new and more intimate technology that sits directly where we hold our sense of self and has potential personality changing side effects. The author also notes that only after we understood the heart through the analogy of a pump was our research focused on fluid dynamics and hydrostatic pressures. In ways like this, the analogies we choose for BCIs can drive their development. And that final point is kind of why I made this video. For these panelists, their analogies are all computational. Human memory is stored like data. Our vision is processed like cameras. Our emotions and consciousness are electrical signals like a computer's. By analogizing ourselves to computers when discussing these technologies, we may end up defining ourselves as computational. We will describe ourselves like a computer so much so that we become those descriptions and lose our humanity on the way. Make no mistake, I fully believe that Neuralink or another BMI company will kind of succeed. There will be implanted brain chips, they will read and decode and stimulate neurons, and they will alter our reality and experience of the world. The numerous studies I point to demonstrate the basic viability of many of their claims. Even if this device does not succeed in making gods, it will doubtlessly succeed in making us no longer entirely human. This is a technology then that requires the input of more than just scientists, more than just engineers. When discussing human consciousness, philosophers should be included in those discussions, artists and painters in the discussions of vision, authors and poets in discussions of telepathy. BMI technology cannot remain solely within the purview of science, for it is a deeply metaphysical technology that is in the purview of all human endeavors. In this video, I tried to show what such a consideration would look like, Watching these panelists speak solely as engineers and computer scientists, I recognize the need for something more. By splicing in scenes from films, clips from shows, quotes from authors and painters and philosophers, I tried to create what I imagine this presentation should have looked like. There should have been philosophers side by side with the network engineers, artists following up on the remarks of neuroscientists. Discussions of BMIs should never be conducted by panels of statisticians, but should be approached like the complicated, convoluted, and amalgamated content of this video. Musk said he wanted the combined will of all people, yet he didn't even put one scholar of the humanities on that panel. Our societies are changing due to technology's gravity, and the medium with which we navigate those technologies are changing us. To quote Marshall McLuhan, the famous media theorist in his work The Medium is the Massage, everything is changing. You, your family, your neighborhood, your education, your job, your government, your relation to the others, and they're changing dramatically. This change is not something that can be left to the realm of computer science, for the human race has produced many brilliant people who are not mathematicians. If we hope to retain our humanity as we interface with computers, we need to consider the silly philosophies of what it means to see, to communicate, to suffer, to be. To be or not to be, that is the question.